For too long, multicultural voices have been absent from the radio. Kansas City's Urban Core, which is a collage of different ethnic communities, provides a unique opportunity to amplify those voices. Filled with vibrant art, music, and talent, this diverse cultural audience deserves to be broadcasted. One Kansas City Radio brings together Latino, African American, and other underrepresented voices in Kansas City by broadcasting music, culture, and dialogue for these communities. We are an international outlet for local musicians, DJs, and community members. Our mission is to bring together the multicultural voices in the Kansas City Urban Core through programming and community services that entertain, educate, inform, and inspire. Does this appeal to you? Join us. Sign up to donate your time, your talent, or your money at onekcradio.org. Be a positive representation in the community. Welcome to the Crown Crafted Music Series produced by One Kansas City Radio in partnership and sponsorship with the Mid-Continent Public Library. We're really excited today to bring you an artist and poet local to Kansas City. His name is Glenn North. He is a poet, an activist, an educator, and arts executive here from Kansas City. And I'm so happy to introduce him. Please enjoy the show. Thank you so much, Ruby. I also want to thank One Kansas City Radio and the Mid-Continent Public Library for having me here today. As Ruby said, I am a poet, and so what you will be hearing today um, is a body of work that I've produced over the past several years. Most of my poems are centered around the historic and contemporary black experience in America with the pursuit of social justice in mind. Uh, I feel like today I'm going to be meeting a new audience, so I thought it might be cool if I started out with a poem that introduced me to you, and this poem is called My Name Is. It was inspired by a couple of things. I do a lot of work with young people, and I've noticed that they are really adamant about you being able to pronounce their names and knowing their names, that's very important to them. And because I'm horrible with names, I have to really practice that. Um, the other thing that we talked about in the discussion of names is how um, when we talk about racism in America, even our names can have a huge impact on how we navigate the world. So for instance, we had a conversation about um, resumes, right? And if a resume um, crosses the desk of an executive who's looking to hire someone, a person whose name Brad works Worthington would probably have a much better shot of getting the interview than Jamal Jenkins, right? So names do carry a lot of weight. And this poem is called again, My Name Is. My name is Glenn Albert North Jr., named after my father, of course, who was the son of Basil North Sr., who was the son of Horace North, who was the son of... Well, we aren't exactly sure because the names and lives of those who had been enslaved were not deemed worthy of documentation. When I was 13, I learned that my name, a transliteration from the Gaelic language means valley or a spacious grassy area, which to my way of thinking is a lot like me. Yes, to my way of thinking, I am much like a low-lying patch of infinite emerald green where shepherds can feed their flocks, where lonely travelers descending from the far-flung hills can find comfort and rest. 
which is to say I'm a pretty laid back type of guy. Yes, my name sits soft on the tongue, fits in your mouth like a warm spring rain that coaxes dandelions to burst through the top layer of soil stemming a million tiny suns. My name is Louise North, the grandmother who taught me to spill my blood on countless blank pages so that the world would never forget that I was here. My name is Michael Brown. My name is Trayvon Martin. My name is Ahmaud Arbery. My name is George Floyd. My name is the name of every black boy, every black man murdered at the hands of cowards fearing the rise of a black planet. My name is Legion. My name is the roar of distant thunder, the defiant chant of brown protesters filling city streets, the jubilant chorus of hymns piercing the roof of the cathedral. My name is this body I offer as a living sacrifice to a jealous God who will exact his wrath on all those who foolishly believe that justice will be limited to this world. So that is my name is. The next poem I'd like to share with you is um, out of the tradition of American poetry or even dating as far back as, gosh, Latin and, and Roman poetry, there's a genre or subgenre of poems known as Ars Poetica. And Ars Poetica poems are written about the art of poetry itself. One of the most highly celebrated Ars Poetica poems was done by a gentleman named Archibald McLeish. And so your homework is to look up his version of an Ars Poetica. I kind of riffed off of that with this poem that I call 21st Century Ars Poetica. A poem should sprout wings and soar across the blank page, contort itself into a vessel that one can fill with rage. Compose syllables into symphonies for the troubled ear, weave itself into threads of memory so folks will know it was here. A poem should be a moonrise, a glow with the lunacy of love, or an altruistic spirit humbly doing what it does. A poem should worship the Creator, lifting its voice to heaven's gate, or be a field of blossoming orchids where truth and beauty consummate. A poem should report the breaking news with wisdom as current as it is ancient and never rush to rhyme, but let line breaks reveal its patience. A poem should still itself with the strength of a Kevlar vest, be a shield that stops the bullet from piercing a brown boy's chest. A poem should be a vaccine, a verse that can cure a virus both metrical and medicinal, inscribed on papyrus. A poem should be as selfless as the heavens and the sea. In short, it should be everything that humans long to be. So as I mentioned, a lot of my work is rooted in the pursuit of social justice. I also really enjoy the idea of collaboration. One of the styles of poetry that I've become very interested in is called ekphrastic poetry. And ekphrastic poetry is poetry that's written in response to a visual image. So there is this beautiful painting at the Nelson, and it depicts a black woman who is obviously distraught. She's holding this black baby who's crying. And you know that something horrible has happened, but you don't know what until you get closer and you see the title of the painting, which was called Lynch Family. So we know then that that woman and that child um, have lost uh, someone to a lynching, her husband to a lynching. And it was done by Joseph Hirsch in 1946. So I was really impressed with the fact that this Jewish painter in the 1940s was empathetic enough to connect with the struggle that black folks were having in terms of racial terror. And this, the painting has this really deep, very blue background. And as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to write, um, that, that blue background kept speaking to me. And eventually um, the title came to me, Lynch Family Blues. And so uh, the introduction is a lot longer than the poem itself. I do wanna mention really quickly, when you understand the history of lynching, you know um, that 
gosh, there were over 4,000 lynchings that took place in America between 1877 and 1950. And those are just the ones that were documented. We know that, you know, from pictures that uh, the lynchings were in a carnival atmosphere, that people would sing songs and, and bring food. And um, it was like a social gathering. And, and the heinousness of this act juxtaposed against this kind of carnival atmosphere uh, was also kind of what inspired uh, the piece. So again, this is called Lynch Family Blues. Went out swinging last night, baby. Hope you didn't wait up for me. Said I was swinging all night, baby. Did you stay up late for me? I wasn't swinging in no joint, darling. I was out on the limb of a tree. Now I'm walking on air, baby. Feels almost like I'm free. My feet steady kicking the wind. Yeah, I'm close to being free. And for the first time in my life, darling, white folks is looking up to me. Hear me, son, your daddy loves you. Keep hanging on to hope. You the man of the house now. Gotta help your mama cope. Daddy won't be coming home no more. I reached the end of my rope. I love being here at Mid-Continent Public Library. I've loved libraries all my life. I uh, done a lot of work also with cultural institutions uh, over the past several years, um, I've worked with the Black Archives, uh, various library systems to put together an annual booklet that looks at overlooked African Americans who helped to form and shape Kansas City. So we will be celebrating the bicentennial of Missouri uh, in August of this year. And so we thought it would be a cool idea to do a commemorative booklet um, that put together all of the uh, all of the people that we've covered over the past several years but then we also thought it might be cool if I added a poem to celebrate the intention of the booklets that we've been doing for the past seven or eight years to really tell these forgotten stories of Kansas City's African-American history and so the title of this poem is called I sing their names, and it opens with a quote, which is really an African proverb, which states, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will glorify the hunter. I know of a place on the confluence of the Missouri and Kansas rivers, originally the home of the Missouri, the Kansas, and the Osage people, the place where York strolling ahead of Lewis and Clark set his left foot down and the whole world tilted west. A place that called out to my grandfather Basil North Sr. who at 16 rode a mule 118 miles from Hartville, Missouri to Jefferson City to attend Lincoln University. He later saved up enough money to send for my grandmother. They both became educators then moved here to Kansas City. Perhaps that is my origin story. Maybe that's why I love this city more than it loves me. Still proud to say it's where I'm from because I know who came before me. My feet find comfort on their shoulders. Those whose light shines brightly beyond February right into eternity. And so I sing of Langston and Parker, Miss Blueford and Mary Lou, Old Buck, Leon Jordan, Horace and Bruce, Sarah Rector, Junius Groves, Tom Bass and Anna Jones, Count Basie, Chester Franklin, Bernard Powell and D.A. Holmes. They are legion and I chant their names almost as if holy because you have to be careful about who you allow to tell your history. As Malcolm once said, folks that won't treat you right won't teach you right. We must tell our own stories, reclaim our narrative. We must read, research, collect, interpret, curate, archive, document, observe, and report. There is a little brown girl in a classroom who has no idea how beautiful her Afro puffs are, and she needs to know. 
There is a little brown boy who doesn't see himself reflected in a biased curriculum, so he loses interest, gets labeled with a behavior disorder, drops out, runs across the right cop on the wrong day, and becomes a headline and a hashtag. He needed to know. There are little white children in schools all over America being taught that the world revolves around them before they grow up to believe that it does, they need to know. I know of a place on the confluence of jazz, blues, baseball, and barbecue, home of countless black lives that certainly mattered. I have no choice but to sing their names. So during the course of the pandemic, we just saw this, what black people have always known, violence against the black body is certainly nothing new, but it just seemed to be such a proliferation of it um, during the pandemic. And we were all stuck at home watching these things play out. Obviously the deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd, which I think was kind of the, the turning point, the, the uh, tipping point, um, as some would describe it. One of the things I felt it was important was to honor Breonna Taylor. In the previous poem, I talked about um, singing their names. And with the murder of Breonna Taylor, one of the things that uh, all of us kept saying was that we need to remember her name. And one of the most popular forms in poetry is the sonnet. And so I thought um, it would be only fitting for me to write a sonnet in honor of Breonna Taylor, who was murdered in Kentucky on March 13, 2020. This poem also opens with a quote. It's from the Washington Post, which stated, the three officers involved in the killing of Breonna Taylor were not charged for her death. One officer, Brett Hankison, was charged with three counts of first degree wanton endangerment for shooting a bullet through the wall into a neighbor's apartment. If those walls could talk, they would chant your name like a cathedral full of praying saints. Cities burn, we see your face in the flames. They murder us daily, then preach restraint. Seems buildings are worth more than black bodies, but that's what the courts would have us believe while the soccer moms go to Pilates and the boys in blue exhale in relief. Every night we sleep on our sweat-soaked sheets, dreaming of the day that we'll get ahead. How in the world will we ever compete if we're too busy burying our dead? So we march, we protest, we keep the faith until the next sister killed takes your place. I also, as I mentioned earlier, work with young people a lot. When I first discovered how poetry could be a, ve a vehicle for mentoring, I connected with an organization called the Kansas City Mentoring Initiative, which was also affiliated with an organization called uh, Storytellers Incorporated. And we were doing a community service project. It was called Sentence to the Arts. And so the idea was to get young people who had been adjudicated, who were in detention centers, who had gotten in trouble with the law, to do community art projects, to inject beauty uh, into these underserved communities. And that would take time off of their sentence or time off of their probation. And it was just an, an awesome program and an awesome idea. But I went in with this intention of I was really going to transform the lives of these young men through the art of poetry. And quite frankly, I did not do a good job of just connecting with them, of just honoring the process. And as I began to learn their stories, I found that they had been up against obstacles that, that I had never been confronted with. And it was very obvious uh, that they needed more <laughs> than poetry uh, to help them uh, navigate their lives a little bit better. So 
that that summer was a long hot one and i don't know that i ever reached the group of young men that i was assigned to work with and that haunted me and so i wrote a poem based on that experience and it's called the prodigal poem this poem is unwanted this poem is illegitimate this poem was an accident i didn't mean to write it yes I let my pen touch the pad, but I was just scribbling, just doodling, just playing around with it like so many other poets before me. See, I thought the paper was on the pill, so I didn't use any protection. No correction tape, no whiteout, no eraser. I wanted to have it aborted, but by the time I had saved up enough loot, it had already reached its third stanza. The paper won't consent to an ink test, so I'm not claiming it, however, I see it hanging out in the hood sometimes. This poem lets its words sag so you can see it's behind. This poem wasn't raised right. It can barely even rhyme. This poem hangs out with weed papers and it drinks too much wine. This poem will be dead before it reaches its 21st line. Crumpled up in some wastebasket next to a suicide letter or tragically executed by a heartless paper shredder. At the very least, it will end up locked behind the bars of some legal pad and it'll be too late then to blame it on dad whoever that may be no this poem won't end happily it's already lost touch with reality heavily influenced by bet it's caught up in some warped hip-hop fantasy it denies the genre to which it belongs this poem thinks that it's a rap song b to the iso e to the ism that's the anthem get all your hands up this poem will never be published, revised, or anthologized. This poem will never reside on a library shelf because this poem is illiterate. It can't even read itself. This poem can never be a real love poem. It's too busy trying to be a Mac Daddy poem, but countless careless encounters have made it a that's just my baby's daddy poem. And it has left fatherless verses and journals and notebooks all over town with each passing line it sinks further down now job psalms proverbs and not just these but ecclesiastes and song of solomon yearned for this poem to follow them these prophetic poems that foretold of the coming messiah and the glory of the new jerusalem reached out to this poem prayed for this poem loved this poem but some poems just don't want to be saved they just crash and burn at the bottom of the page And while the memory of that summer does haunt me, and I often wonder what happened to those young men, um, that poem and that experience, I think, gave me what I needed to move forward in that work. And I feel that after that, I was much more effective in my connection with young people who were experiencing similar circumstances. So I would always wanna thank them for, for teaching me much more than I ever taught them. Well, thank you for tuning in to the Crown Crafted Music Series. Uh, we're taking a short break to talk to Glenn and get to know him a little bit better. Um, I have a few questions for him. And my first question is, you know, what inspired you to become a poet? That is a good question. So my grandmother and I spent a lot of time together when I was growing up. She uh, took care of me because both of my parents worked and uh, she was an educator. And you hear her name come up in a lot of my poems or I refer to her in a lot of my poetry because on my eighth birthday, she gave me a copy of this poem called If by Rudyard Kipling and she challenged me to memorize it so i was not very happy about that i was used to getting toys i was used to you know birthday stuff and to get this poem really kind of came out of the blue but i loved her and and she challenged me to memorize it and so i did and a few days later i remember even though i didn't understand the poem the fact that i could could recite it back to her made me feel really good and uh the poem i won't do the whole thing but it's like if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about don't deal in lies or being hated not give way to hating and yet not look too good nor talk too wise and it goes on and on it gives you 
all of these things that are kind of a prescription for what it means to be a, a good person. And she said, if you live out the philosophy of that poem, um, then you'll be a better man. And so, uh, I love the cadence, the, the, the rhyme. I didn't, as I said, fully understand it, but, um, I, I began to write my own poem shortly thereafter. Uh, later on in life, I found out that Rudyard Kipling was this horrible racist, right? Oh, gosh. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, he posthumously and, and unbeknownst to him gifted me with, with uh, a, a tool, a vehicle uh, to combat his way of thinking. But anyway, that was a, a sidebar. But it started with my grandmother giving me this poem when I was eight years old. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. What did you have a specific moment later on in life that you said, I'm pursuing this? Yeah. So uh, when I was in my 20s, I moved to D.C. I at that point just didn't have I hadn't finished college and I was just kind of working around Kansas City and not doing anything other than going to work and a friend who was moving to dc he was pretty wealthy um said hey man you should come move to dc with me it'll be a change of atmosphere for you uh, he knew i loved art and culture and there's a lot of that obviously in dc and he thought i might kind of get my footing there and sure enough you know my plan was to finish college at at howard university i was working on uh howard's campus and they had this great tuition reimbursement program so that was the plan but a friend of mine saw me writing in my journal one day and he said hey do you, do you write poetry and i said yeah he said well you should come check out uh the joints on u street there's a lot of venues where they're performing spoken word and i had never even heard that term and i was like you know what is that and he was like you should just come check it out you see what i'm talking about and I brought my journal and I go to this spot called State of the Union. I never forget. It's in the northwest section of uh, D.C. or it was. It's not there anymore. And uh, I decided to share this poem because I was hearing all these great poets and I just loved the energy. And I shared this poem and I got this, you know, I got a standing ovation, quite frankly. You know what I mean? So like in that moment, I was hooked and then moved back to Kansas City a couple of years after that. And there wasn't much going on like that here. But I had heard about all of the revitalization efforts in the 18th and Vine District. I was really excited about that. And I was talking to one of my friends about that. And he was like, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of excitement down here. You always talk about how much fun you had living in D.C. What do you think about starting a poetry reading here? And I was like, yeah, like, why not? Like, all you need is like a microphone in a space. And so we found this little dive bar on 19th and Vine. And uh, we started this open mic called Verbal Attack. And it was successful. The city seemed to be really hungry for something like that at the time. And we really tried to connect with poets and artists who were also interested in social justice. And we did that for about three years. And then I got hired at the Jazz Museum as the poet in residence there. And that really wow. kind of solidified things. That's awesome story. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Just bless those friends that really push us and give us those, Isn't that right? those resources <laughs> and, and yeah look in on us and give us you know give us the inspiration to to pursue something sure, sure so can you give us some insight on you know your creative process and any resources or tools that have been really instrumental to you while you've been creating and um, maybe even researching or or learning in order to make your sure, art sure sure so a lot of uh, what i do as i said is uh kind of a poetic commentary on on the black experience and i have the lived experience of being a black person but there's so much of our history that is intentionally erased or or overlooked and so when i began working at the american jazz museum i began to understand the importance of cultural institutions i'd always love libraries uh, you know, my father would want to take me to a baseball game. And I'd be like, no, I'd rather go to the library. He's like, you cannot be my son. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, I just was always more interested in reading and, and doing research and learning than I was with 
you know, athlete, not to say anything against athletics and sports or any of that. It just wasn't um, how I was hardwired. So I've always had an affinity for museums and, and cultural spaces. So uh, it just kind of came full circle when I started working at the Jazz Museum. Then it was the uh, Black Archives of Mid-America. I did a stint there. I'm currently the executive director of the Bruce R. Watkins Cultural Heritage Center, uh, where we do a lot of cultural programming. Um, and Throughout all of that, I've always worked with libraries and um, different uh, archives in different places like the Missouri Valley Special Collection uh, and just different places where you can find information that, that helps inform what I write. And then in terms of my process, uh, I am very, uh, I don't just sit down and write a poem. It takes me a while. I typically write down notes. Uh, I look up different things that might not find them way find their way into the poem, but helps me to think about how the poem should be written or presented. And when I figure out, I call it the scaffolding. When I figure out whether it's going to be a sonnet or free verse or what have you, or what kind of mechanism I'm going to use to drive the poem, then I put all those puzzle pieces together. And then create your and art. And yeah, then then there's the poem. Yeah. So I share that love of libraries with you as mm -hmm. well and music. You know, mm -hmm. this is a music this is a music series mm -hmm. and I I know that you know the precursor to music is also spoken word. Mm -hmm. It's poetry, a mm -hmm. lot of um, hip hop, a lot of music is, you know, based in that. And uh, I just is there and I'm I'm curious about this. Is there a a book or a song that um, has been instrumental in your process or in your career? Yeah, so uh, there's a book that was edited by Dudley Randall called The Black Poets. And it goes from field hollers that happened during the era of slavery because music has always been very much a part of the black and brown experience and our struggle for liberation. So it starts with that and it goes through, you know, folks like Phyllis Wheatley, who was the first black person to publish a poem in America, to the uh, Harlem Renaissance, which took place in the 1920s and 30s when black folks were really saying we are capable of producing high art and that you should view us as human beings. And then it goes into the black arts movement, which was the 60s and 70s with folks like Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez, who were very revolutionary and really felt like poems should communicate revolutionary thought. I mean, it's just like a compendium of all of these great poems that inspires me. Um, that's one. And then you said you said a book or music. Music. If there's been any um, music. Yeah. Um, so uh marvin gay what's going on oh, yeah. is just a uh, an album that i think is pretty close to perfect mm -hmm. in its ability to combine just the aesthetic of beautiful music and revolutionary thought yeah i love marvin gay that's yeah. a great album yeah okay well i summer of soul i don't know <laughs> <laughs> if you've not seen it, um, Questlove, who's The Roots, yeah. you know, he's a drummer for The Roots. Um, he recently did this documentary that's on Hulu now uh, called Summer of Soul. In the same uh, year that Woodstock happened, there was the Harlem Cultural Festival that took place. And all of these great artists, Stevie Wonder, um, uh, Mahalia Jackson, Nina Simone, they were all performing in Harlem. And it was filmed and documented, but nobody was really interested in telling that story. So you always hear about Woodstock but you never hear about the Harlem Cultural Festival anyway he did this great documentary about it and it just really to me demonstrates the power of music the power of art the power of lyrics and poetry uh, to impact uh, and, and it seems that a lot of other people understood it because it's almost like that information was kind of suppressed but it's out there now so anyway shout out to quest love for putting that out there absolutely yeah. well those are great resources mm -hmm. and you know i know those things have inspired you and have helped inform your art and it's great to also get something like a documentary i know you know this generation maybe they're not at the library so often uh, but i know a lot of people are watching streaming services so you know that's a that's a great resource for somebody that's more of a visual learner sure. um Thank you for sharing that. That really that really helps me understand more of, of your art. And I, as I was listening to, you know, you speak and you share your poetry, you know, it was very touching. And it, um, you know, it was 
it, at some points it was really hard to you know tone down the emotion that I was having that was coming up so as an you know as a poet and as an artist I really appreciate you speaking and using your voice and um, you know saying saying those words that that can move people to just consider and think more into the experience of you know people that may not be like them or you know the or, or you know just opposite cultures or opposite genders so I really appreciate that from you um, and so with that being said you know what's next what's next for you what do you have coming up um, and you know just share with us uh, other ways that we can you know consume your art and support you thank you so much for all of that I really do I really do appreciate it I never take it for granted it means a lot to me uh, right now uh, I'm one of the of founders and I'm the artistic director of Louder Than a Bomb KC. And so as luck would have it, we are in a library um, and I am trying to build Louder Than a Bomb KC, which is a youth poetry festival in which students from various high schools throughout the Kansas City area compete performing their original spoken word poetry. Uh, but the real focus is the art of poetry. The real focus is them finding their creative voices. The real focus is having young Young people understand the importance of social justice and the role that they can play in making the world better. And so uh, we've been at it for uh, eight years. 2020, of course, the pandemic derailed it. We've been doing everything really grassroots up until then. And so um, we had to revamp and, and pivot. And we were able to have a virtual competition earlier in the spring. Uh, so the uh, team from Blue Springs uh, High School won. And so they're now preparing for a national competition called Brave New Voices, uh, which is actually international. Students from all over will be competing, but it'll also be virtual this year. Anyway, gearing up for that. Um, so uh, and then uh, my website, as I said, is uh, Glenn with two N's North, like the direction North Poetry. So that's GlennNorthPoetry.com. Um, and I'm working on making sure that I keep that updated with things that that I'm working on. I recently did the, um, as I mentioned, uh, the visual piece that is in the Nelson as part of the testimony exhibit. Uh, so that exhibit testimony with the african-american artist collective will be up through march so hopefully folks will be able uh, to go and and check that out and i am really trying to do uh, more writing from an internal kind of personal space i've been very good about these kind of issues and writing about like things that are going on kind of inspired by the news or you know different things that are going on in the black community but uh, kind of getting in tune with what's going on internally and communicating that and how that connects with what i see happening in the world so writing has taken me on so many different journeys uh, the most recent one is um an opportunity that I had to attend a writing retreat in the small town of Arrow Rock, Missouri, population 56. And I knew there were a group of really motivated, progressive, uh, well-intentioned, wanting to do the right thing, anti-racist uh, folks who organized this retreat. And the hope is that uh, the artists who attend the retreat and the writers that participate would shine a light on the overlooked African-American history of that town and to possibly generate an interest of black people moving back into that town. And so I was excited, but I was also nervous. Uh, I spent a lot of time just sitting in discomfort. You know, I thought about folks like John Lewis and Megger Evers, you know, people who willingly took uh, on the, 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 the risk of their lives to make things better. So I'm certainly not trying to compare my experience to theirs, but sitting in that small town at night, I felt a very kind of visceral connection with them. I knew that there might be people in that town who didn't want me there, and I felt very vulnerable. Um, but as I said, it, it, it did a great deal in terms of increasing my empathy. But one night I was there, there was this really horrible storm, and uh, that night I really found it hard to sleep. I should also mention really quickly, 
that uh, I'm a person of faith. I say that very humbly. I know that there are probably several different belief systems that are represented in the audience that will um, be checking out this poetry reading. But one of the things that I attempt to do is to go through the Bible each year and there's a schedule that there's an app right and it sends you this uh, portion of the bible that you read every day and as you read through the bible by uh, the end of the year you've read through the entire bible so i was doing that while i was there and the the, the stormy night and all of that it just kind of converged and so this is the poem that was the result of all of that and the poem is called based on a true story the poet spends a stormy night at a writer's residency in Arrow Rock or horror poem ending with a Bible verse in which the good Lord likens the poet to the Apostle Paul. You tell yourself it is just the wind, but the paranoia has already set in. The whispering familiar fear of traveling through life in a black body that is sometimes drowned out by the noise of the city becomes a scream in the midnight air of a small town. You are the only black man here, perceived sinner in a cathedral of whiteness. The first drops of rain pelt the window like the gossamer finger of a beckoning ghost. The strobe of lightning, the clap of thunder unsettles you because you have seen this movie before. The black guy always dies first. The cottage you are sleeping in becomes a shrine of shadows. Each room, the scene of your massacre. Beyond each door, a demon dancing at your death. Atmospheric rumblings or truck engines revving in the distance each billowing branch of the pecan tree asks, what business you got down here, boy? The irony is you were invited here to participate in a research project, to be the subject, the melanated variable, in a benevolent experiment to study the shelf life of a contemporary black body in an antebellum ecosystem. In that space, as the storm rises, to a roar, you wonder if this self-proclaimed Little Dixie, mid-Missouri town is any different from Meridian, Mississippi in 1964, where the soil swallowed the broken bodies of three young men trying to register black folks to vote. But you think, hey, what's the big deal? You are not here registering people to vote in the 1960s. You are just here to write poems, right? But isn't every iteration of blackness, political or poetic, grounds for decapitation? Which seems appropriate because you are losing your head. Your mind becomes an appendage you wish to amputate. Anything, just so long as you don't have to think. There is a cemetery in your chest, so filled with bodies that there isn't enough dirt to bury them. You despise this fear, this psychosis that gnaws at your hope like a wake of buzzards descending to devour a corpse. You want to believe that this group of well-meaning white people recognize your talent, your skill, your worth, that your work merited this retreat. You want to believe, but deep down you know that for black folks, every honor is laced with horror. The torrential rain batters the cottage like bullets breaking another black body as you seek the solace of slumber and somehow manage to lay your body down to sleep. The next morning, you praise the good Lord for getting you through the night. Your daily devotions are leading you through the book of Acts, so you crack open the Bible to pick up from where you left off yesterday. And the passage says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night, by vision and you hear God whisper to your spirit I'm telling you now like I told Paul then be not afraid but speak and hold not thy peace for I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee for I have much people in this city you continue to the next verse which says and Paul which is now you 
continued there a year and six months, which for you is two weeks, teaching the word of God among them, or in your case, simply sharing a few poems. And all God's children said, Amen. So when I first began writing poetry, I hosted an open mic poetry event in the 18th and Vine District called Verbal Attack. And shortly after that, I got hired at the American Jazz Museum as a poet in residence. So jazz has always been a huge influence on my work. And one of the poets who saw that similarly was Langston Hughes, who most would argue is the progenitor of the jazz poetry genre. But another poet who wrote in that tradition was Allen Ginsberg, one of the beat poets. And he, with a poem called Howl, totally revolutionized contemporary American poetry. He was touching on some very kind of taboo topics and also using jazz as a way to pattern the cadence of the poem. And he uh, himself said, the line length, you'll notice, they're all built on bop. You might think of them as a bop refrain, chorus after chorus after chorus, the idea being, say, Lester Young in Kansas City in 1938, blowing 72 choruses of the man I love until everyone in the hall was out of his head. And so I'm going to start with just an ex excerpt from Howl to give you a sense of the rhythm. And then I'm going to transition into uh, the, the poem that I wrote that is inspired by that in uh, creative writing programs is called writing like a shadow poem where you take a poem that is a classic or you know a traditional poem or one that you admire and you kind of do a spin off of that and uh, so this is called howl the remix after allen ginsburg i saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness starving hysterical naked dragging themselves through the negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz <clears throat> i saw the stupefied souls of my generation ravaged by the heinous heresy that a hyper hedonistic self-seeking i mean my existence could bring them joy souls clothed in insatiable flesh folding themselves into medicine cabinets scurrying into translucent sepia toned bottles seduced by pharmaceutical solutions to substantiate a pseudo reality opioid oafs who somehow believed themselves to be better than the meth heads and crack whores tweaking on 39th and Main. Souls racked with existential angst, so swathed in the sashes of self-absorption and neo-narcissism, desensitized to the ultraviolence of the dumb diddy dum dum day that the bullet-ridden blood-soaked infant ghosts of Sandy Hook barely give them pause. Souls in gentrified, exposed brick downtown lofts, northeast roach-infested tenements, overpriced midtown two stories, angry brookside cottages, make America great again, Lee Summit ranch styles, all stuck on their stupid couches of obesity, stymied in a Netflix stupor, a bizarre banal binge-watching bonanza of buffoonery. Souls no longer seeking truth and beauty and art, are the muse in music having turned their backs on jazz sat settle for canned computerized cacophonic caricatures lacking composition monotonous auto-tuned sorted strip club symphonies twerk tracks transcribed for titillation i've seen souls in need of screens any screen to facebook snapchat instagram tweet looking for swipe right love and likes from strangers posting photos of their vacuously vain vacations in their mundane megalomaniacal meals while little girls in Flint, Michigan don't have clean drinking water. Souls of grown men obsessed with playing with balls, playing with their own balls, erotomaniacs purveying porn, 
pulverizing their penises, a potpourri of predatory predilection so perverse, so pervasive that the touch from a real woman leaves them impotent. Souls of women diminished into dysmorphic delusions, lifting, nipping, tucking, cutting, injecting, dieting, dying for a Photoshop fantasy frame, a Botox vision of beauty that can never be obtained. Souls with holes that can't be filled, bartering their bodies on Craigslist or Tinder, but no tenderness, no authentic intimacy, no caress, only the conjugal clanking of jankety genitals joined in an unregenerate gyration of jaundice and jism. As I stood on the corner of 18th and Vine, a Charlie Parker tune howling from the blue room, I counted myself among those souls, dodging the image of myself reflected in the windows of cars passing by, not wanting to see the man I said I'd never be, the man I have become, another in the legion of souls who in the vanity of mortality cobble together gods from dream catchers and crystals, swastikas and pistols, synthetic gods who would worship us. And I watched Jesus wave goodbye from a Greyhound bus Oh Lord, who will we pray to now? So interestingly enough, I did this residency in Arrow Rock that I talked about just a few moments ago. But several years prior, I had an opportunity to participate in a program called Community Curators that was sponsored by the Kansas City Museum. And the idea was to get people in the community to find an object in their collection and to write an essay about the significance of that object, perhaps the history of it, what have you. So when I went into the collection, I had hoped to, found some, hoped to find something that connected with the black experience. And the only thing I was able to come across was this painting of a gentleman named Doc Brown. And it was a painting of this man kind of standing there holding his hat. And it just reminded me of the stereotypical uh, dancing black man. It, it reminded me of minstrelsy. And I at first felt like this sense of, of shame, but because that was about the only object that I could find that spoke to the black experience, I decided that I was gonna focus on that. Um, as it turns out, Doc Brown was from Arrow Rock, Missouri, and I just wanted to share a little bit about what I discovered about him. Uh, Joseph Doc Brown, also known as Dr. William Henry Joseph Cutter Brown, was born circa 1835. He was a slave on the Meredith Miles Marmaduke estate at Arrow Rock near Marshall, Missouri. Many years later, in 1868, he moved to Kansas City and began to develop a name for himself as a champion cakewalker. In an interview, one of his closest friends, William Fitzpatrick, stated, I knew him in Marshall when he carried papers he always had a crowd following him. I told him that town was too small for his talents and that he ought to go to Kansas City. He was a natural born cakewalker. The cakewalk that Fitzpatrick spoke of originated as a slave dance contest in the antebellum South. In his book, From Cakewalks to Concert Halls, Thomas L. Morgan explains, white slave owners were fond of awarding cakes to the best slave dancers at special social gatherings. The slaves themselves, however, were developing their dancing into a parody of the mannerisms and fashions of the white Southern social elite. So it became impressive to me that, or impressed upon me, that the cakewalk was really an act of defiance. And so the sense of shame that I had when I first encountered the portrait was then transformed when I understood, you know, the significance of the cakewalk and, and Doc Brown and, and who he was and the, the level of success he was able to achieve at a time where black people uh, were really, um, were still struggling obviously, but, but even more so in the 1800s. And so I wrote this poem inspired by him called Why Black Folks Like to Dance. 
And it opens with a quote. I like to open with quotes uh, from Ralph Ellison, who said in his book, Shadow and Act, for the art, the blues, the spirituals, the jazz, the dance was what we had in place of freedom. You study the darkness of my body, desiring to know the curve and the line. Whips scarred my back, but never broke my spine. You implement strategies designed to steal what's inherently mine. You want to move like me, to groove like me, to boogaloo like me, but your body can't move like mine because it never needed to. I cakewalked out your slavery and you couldn't lynch my blues. You even try to dance, but you stuck with two left shoes. My hips undulate with a passion that shakes pine cones loose. My frame contorts in ways that Sherlock could not deduce with every oppressor I face and throughout every abuse. My movements possess a beauty that only struggle could produce. I keep it moving with the quickness, with the panther's agility. Got a Lindy hop too fast for the naked eye to see. I call my left leg Malcolm and Martin is my right. I can march the streets of Birmingham at noontime and dance all Saturday night. Never understood how you could love my music, my walk, my talk, my style, but hate me so intensely. Why am I so reviled? May not ever get the answers on this side of eternity, but one thing is for certain, I'ma keep on doing me. I'ma dance like there's no tomorrow and sing at the top of my lungs. It ain't no use in fighting when I've already won. So I would like to end with a poem that I wrote several years ago uh, in honor of Kansas City's incredible jazz, le uh, jazz legacy. I had an opportunity to work with a group of musicians, uh, the Jazz Disciples, on a project. And uh, for me, it was important to think about the effort at that time. You know, Kansas City back in the 1920s and 30s was an epicenter for jazz. Uh, Tom Pendergast, Boss Tom, as some called him, ran Kansas City. His family had a liquor distribution company. He was in league with all of the politicians. Uh, there was also a very pronounced uh, organized crime element in Kansas City at the time, and he was connected. And so he created, he, he, he established Kansas City as what was known then as a wide open town. So prohibition was not heavily enforced here. And then Kansas City became a great place to open up a jazz club. So much so that by the time the 1930s rolled around, there were over 300 different jazz clubs in the greater Kansas City area. Uh, many would argue that Kansas City was the prototype uh, for Las Vegas and Kansas City then became uh, the, 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 the place where all of these greats traveled through and produced arguably the greatest jazz musician who ever lived, Charlie Parker. So this poem is called Revival. There is a place where parched lips kiss warped reeds and cramped fingers stroke strings and keys, filling the air with melodies and resurrected rhapsodies capture the cadence of ancient chants where shackles are removed and our ancestors dance in anticipation of liberty. And every note that's played is dedicated to their memory. There is a place where each heartache and every sharp pain can be soothed and smoothed by medicinal refrain. The story of King David makes it plain. And it came to pass that when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. You see, this divinely inspired requiem came forth from a glorious past. And although it defies description, we choose to call it jazz. And ever since this magical music has emerged from space and time, it has found a permanent residence on 9 plus 9 and Vine. Someday soon you'll travel there to escape from cell phones and emails and faxes, from being overworked and underpaid and paying too many taxes. This is the place where even struggle kicks off his shoes and relaxes, and the only war that will ever take place is the battle of the Saxes. This is the place where jazz is served up as a sensual delight. And it smells like grandmother's chitlins because she always cooks them just right. And it tastes like the peach cobbler she bakes that gets better 
with every bite. And it feels like love's very first kiss shared in the soft moonlight. And it looks like Susanna Jones when she wears that red dress. Lord, what a beautiful sight. And it sounds like the jazz disciples cool on a blue Monday night or like Gabriel's Trump at the rapture just before we take flight. So these ministers of music are awaiting your arrival, wanting to provide you with orchestral comfort as you witness the revival because jazz like matter can't be destroyed. It only changes forms. And the historic intersection of 18th and Vine is where jazz will be reborn. Then we will cherish this noble noise and glow in the cool of its heat as the caramel coated cacophony provides a sonically hypnotic beat that can only ever be heard through the tapping soles of the feet and as willing slaves to the rhythm our freedom will be complete so i want to thank you all for listening i want to thank the mid-continent public library and 1kc radio for providing this platform and i hope that you all have an incredible summer and that you will check out my website which is glenn north glenn with two n's glenn north poetry um, dot com uh, i'm also a part of the african-american artist collective we currently have an exhibit um, at the nelson atkins museum of art called testimony that will be up through march very excited to have a visual piece in that exhibit which is new territory for me so hopefully you will get a chance to check that out and that you will continue to support 1kc radio the mid-continent public library and the crown crafted series thank you so much again thank you so much for sharing your art today with us and you know thank you to everybody that tuned in um, you're watching the crown crafted music series um, this is in partnership and sponsorship with the mid-continent library if you didn't catch the whole thing you can still catch it on our website one casey radio um, one Casey Radio's website. Uh, this will be on the YouTube and on the Facebook. And again, we just want to thank everybody for tuning in and keep an eye out for all of our other programming and all of our other artists that we are going to be featuring. Thank you.